In the late spring of 2002, 44-year-old Teresa Gilcrease embarked on a month-long visit back to her hometown of Alexandria, Louisiana. Having moved across the country to Oregon the previous year, she couldn't wait to catch up with friends, spend time with family, and most importantly, attend her daughter's high school graduation. For three fantastic weeks, everything went according to plan, and Teresa was enjoying every minute of it, until one quiet Sunday night, when she never made it back home. By the next morning, her family was engaged in a desperate search, calling everyone they could think of, but no one knew where Teresa could be. As her relatives tried to calm the growing feeling of dread overwhelming their senses, a breaking news broadcast would open the door to a grim possibility no one yet had the courage to confront. On the outskirts of town off the side of a rural road, detectives were investigating the discovery of a woman's body. She'd been found lying in a grassy field near an old barn amidst a large tract of farmland where few ever traveled outside of those who worked there. Investigators were shocked by the grisly nature of the crime, referring to it as an extreme example of overkill carried out by a cruel and calculating monster. By the time Teresa's family stirred up the courage to call the sheriff's department, they already knew the horror of the truth. It was her lying in that field. While the family struggled to imagine what kind of animal could have committed such a heinous crime against their loving daughter, sister, and mother, Investigators assured them that they would identify and capture the killer in short order. They had no way of knowing at the time just how wrong they were. Initially, it was believed that the crime had to have been personal, committed by someone Teresa knew. But as the investigation dragged on, it became clear that nothing about this case was obvious. Detectives began to wonder if perhaps Teresa had been the target of a random attack, and with that possibility came a disturbing notion. Had the yet unidentified Baton Rouge serial killer decided to expand his hunting ground 100 miles north to Alexandria? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 180, The Murder of Teresa Gilcrease, Part 1. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we begin part one of our examination into the 2002 murder of 44-year-old Teresa Gilcrease. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. In mid-May, Teresa Gilcrease left her new home in Oregon for a month-long trip back to Louisiana. She was excited to see her family and friends, to spend time with her daughter, and to watch her obtain her high school diploma. As the trip drew near its end, Teresa began to think of the journey back to the Pacific Northwest, never imagining that she wouldn't make it out of Louisiana alive. This is Episode 180, The Murder of Teresa Gilcrease, Part 1. One hundred and twenty miles northwest of Louisiana's capital of Baton Rouge sits the city of Alexandria, the seat of Rapides Parish. The ninth largest city in the state, Alexandria is known for its rich history, as well as the seamless blend of both stunning natural beauty and a bustling downtown flush with art centers, museums, and attractions. Somehow, despite the ever-growing population and expansion of the city, Alexandria has a reputation for maintaining its small-town feel and being a highly desirable location to settle down and raise a family. In the early 2000s, Louisiana found itself gathering headline news from coast to coast as a series of unsolved murders and assaults plagued police in Baton Rouge. A task force was eventually formed which aimed at identifying, locating, and apprehending the killer who, despite the brutality and viciousness of his crimes, 
had managed to elude law enforcement and continue his lethal attacks. While police in the capital were on high alert and residents were growing more concerned about a killer on the loose, two hours north in Alexandria, there wasn't a lot of worry. Most people felt secure in their belief that crimes like that only happened in the big cities, not their quiet town. In June of 2002, however, one grisly murder would call everything into question. On a humid Monday morning on the outskirts of town, a farm employee making his way to work made a horrifying discovery. Turning on to a dirt and gravel road surrounded by vast farmland and lush greenery, the man suddenly came to a dead stop. Just off the side of the road in the middle of a field near an old barn, he spotted the motionless figure of a woman. The green of the grass stood in sharp contrast to red smears of blood staining the field and soaking into the earth around the body's shadowy silhouette. Investigators arriving on the scene were struck by the overwhelmingly violent and cold-blooded murder, referring to it in the public as one of the worst cases of overkill they'd ever seen. Initially, there was a belief that the case would break quickly, and the killer would be identified before he had the opportunity to strike again. Mere weeks later, detectives would come to realize that there would be nothing easy about this case, and soon they were faced with a frightening question. Had this been a random crime committed by someone living in Alexandria or nearby, or was it possible that the Baton Rouge serial killer had brought his brand of terror to their peaceful town? Teresa Marie Wren was born on Friday, February 14, 1958, to parents Elvin and Carol in Finley, Hancock County, Ohio. Teresa was the Wren's second child, having an older brother, and over the next few years, the family would be rounded out to four siblings with the birth of two younger sisters. Teresa was described by friends and family as a very loving and compassionate person who adored animals, cared deeply for her family, and would drop anything at a moment's notice to help someone in need. Throughout the early years of her life, Teresa didn't have solid stakes in the ground, with her family moving several times. When she was a teenager, she was living in the city of Mountain Home, the seat of Elmore County, Idaho. It was there that Teresa would attend Mountain Home High School, where she consistently pulled in exceptional grades, landing on the honor roll each year. Intelligent and driven, she was already making plans for the future, looking for a career which would utilize her innate desire to help others. But Teresa wouldn't go on to graduate from Mountain Home, however, as her family would pick up stakes once again. This time, the move would be permanent, with the family traveling nearly 2,000 miles to the southeast, landing in her father Elvin's home state of Louisiana. The Wrens settled in the small town of Boyce in Rapides Parish, 15 miles northwest of the larger city of Alexandria. Teresa would go on to attend her senior year at Alexandria High School, graduating with her usual high grades in 1976. She would eventually become involved in a serious relationship with Harold Folk, seven years her senior. In the spring of 1983, the couple married. At the time, Teresa was 25, while Harold was 32. The newlyweds moved in together in Alexandria, and less than a year later, they would welcome their first and only child, a daughter named Trisha. At this point, Teresa's life took a dramatic shift as Trisha would become the center of her universe. A loving and affectionate mother, friends have commented on how devoted she was and the way she was always smiling when talking about her daughter, who was like her little twin. The resemblance between Teresa and Trisha was something people were always bringing up. Unfortunately, while Trisha's birth had been a blessing to her mother, the relationship between Teresa and Harold began hitting the rocks fairly early on, and they were separated by October of 1984. Over the course of the next few years, Teresa had to take Harold to court on several occasions as he failed to make mandated child support payments. He'd eventually move out of the state and settle in North Carolina. Teresa remained in Louisiana, staying close to her family and raising her daughter. A few years later, she'd fall in love again, this time to a man seven years her junior. Shannon J. Gilcrease lived in nearby Colfax and attended Northwestern State University, graduating in 88. He obtained a bachelor's degree in pharmaceutical studies. Teresa and Shannon's relationship developed quickly, with friends and family noting that the two were head over heels, making it no surprise when just a short time later they were married. 
Now, with her husband at home and her daughter getting older, Teresa turned her attention back towards education and a career. Attending Shannon's alma mater of NSU, Teresa majored in social work, and in 1995, she was named as receiving the Outstanding Social Work Major Award. As had always been her way, she was also named as one of the students who'd maintained straight A's and earned a spot on the honor list. Teresa received her Bachelor of Arts that same year, and almost as quickly as she finished up at NSU, she turned around and enrolled at Louisiana State University, where in the summer of 1996, she received her master's degree in social work at the age of 38. For the next few years, Teresa and Shannon lived and worked out of Alexandria while Tricia began attending Bolton High School. In 2001, Shannon received an offer for a new position with far better pay, but there was a catch. The new job was 2,000 miles away in Oregon. After a lot of discussion about the opportunity, both Teresa and Shannon agreed that they couldn't turn it down, so they began making plans for the big move. Trisha only had another year of high school left, so rather than pulling her out to move with them, Teresa arranged for her daughter to move in with her parents to finish up school at Bolton. Teresa and Shannon settled into a nice home on Spring Loop Creek in Baker City, Oregon. Despite the distance, she kept in close contact with her daughter and family, making several visits back to Louisiana, where she'd stay for several weeks at a time. In the spring of 2002, Trisha would be graduating, so Teresa began making plans for a month-long visit. Since Shannon wasn't able to get an extended amount of time off from his new job, she'd be making the trip alone. After celebrating her 44th birthday in February, Teresa finalized her travel plans and was noticeably excited about the trip and getting to spend a whole month visiting with her family and seeing old friends. She had no way of knowing at the time, but she would never make it back to Oregon. During the week of May 13th, Teresa left her home and made the 90-minute drive north to Eastern Oregon Regional Airport, boarding a flight to Dallas. Once in Texas, she rented a car from the Dollar Rent-A-Car Company and made the 300-mile drive east. It was a long drive, but it made the most sense to Teresa, as it would be less expensive and she'd have access to her own vehicle during her visit, enabling her to come and go as she pleased. Teresa would spend the majority of the trip staying at her parents' Ulster Avenue home in Boyce, where she'd get to spend a lot of time with her parents and, of course, her beloved daughter. Everything went well through the end of May, with friends and family reporting that Teresa seemed happy and excited to be in town. When the first weekend of June approached, Trisha had made arrangements for a friend to visit from out of town. Not wanting to horn in on her daughter's time with her friend, and already believing conditions at her parents' home were cramped, she made a reservation to spend the weekend at a hotel. On Friday, June 7th, Teresa checked in for two nights at the Ramada Inn Limited on MacArthur Drive in Alexandria, a 15-minute drive from her parents' home. She'd originally planned to head back to Oregon 11 days later on June 18th, but tragically, before the weekend would end, Teresa would become the victim of a brutal and senseless murder. On the morning of Sunday, June 9th, she checked out of the hotel and went back to her parents' boys' home. According to the Town Talk newspaper, that afternoon, Teresa agreed to give her daughter's friend a ride home to the town of Rushton in Lincoln Parish, 100 miles north of Boyce. According to Bruce Sanders, a friend of Teresa's and the father of Trisha's friend, upon arriving in Rushton, the two decided to go out and grab dinner together at a local restaurant. When they finished up, Teresa dropped Bruce off back at his home, where he tried to convince the 44-year-old to stay the night rather than making the hour-and-a-half drive back home. According to Sanders, however, Teresa was insistent that she wasn't tired, and she'd rather make the drive that night as opposed to having to get up and do it in the morning without a fresh change of clothes. Leaving rushed in that night, Teresa began the drive back, but for reasons no one yet fully understands, she chose not to go straight to her parents' house and apparently didn't tell anyone of her alternate plans for the evening. That night... There wasn't an overwhelming amount of concern about Teresa's absence. When she hadn't made it home by the time everyone was going to bed, it was just assumed that she'd run into a friend and was spending time visiting, or maybe she'd hit bad traffic on the long drive home. It wouldn't be until the next morning that anyone felt something might be wrong, but they never could have imagined the true nightmare that was about to begin. Sunrise occurred at 6.06 a.m. on Monday, June 10th. 
The day began much as the weekend had ended. Cloudy skies hovering above Alexandria with humidity nearing 100% and a light, cool breeze sliding in from the southeast. While the majority of residents didn't need to rise with the sun most mornings, local farm owners and their employees were already beginning their day's work. South of Alexandria, the busy city center begins to fade. Crowded sidewalks and congested streets making way for the greenery of sprawling farmland. While Highway 71 and Interstate 49 slice through the rural outskirts of town carrying commuters past countless farms and fields, many of the roads which divide these different plots of land from one another are lesser traveled, being little more than dirt paths sprinkled with loose gravel. One such path is Jenkins Road. You can see this in the Vodacast if you're using the app. The link is in the show notes. Beginning just west of Highway 71, Jenkins Road juts out at a sharply southwestern angle before straightening out where it runs due west for nearly two miles amid cattle and rice farms stretching out for miles before it becomes little more than two thin dirt pads cutting through the grass. Outside of farm workers making their way in for another busy day, most people didn't even notice the narrow roadway as it splits from the main streets and disappears beyond the old railroad tracks. After this morning, however, there would be few who would ever forget Jenkins Road and the haunting memory of what happened there. At approximately 6.40 a.m., a local farm employee turned onto the road not long after the morning sun began peeking through the treetops. Following the curve, the man approached a Y-shaped split, turning his wheel to the right to continue down towards a group of newer buildings constructed nearby to an aging barn. It was a drive he'd made hundreds if not thousands of times over the previous handful of years, and maybe that's what caused his attention to immediately be captured by the shape of something which did not belong. Slowly coming to a stop, the man shifted his truck in the park and stepped down onto the dirt. In the middle of a large field of grass stretching from the barn to the edge of the road, the man saw what appeared to be the figure of a person lying motionless in the morning dew. After taking a few steps into the field, the man suddenly noticed red smears contrasting against the green of the grass. Realizing that something was horribly wrong, he turned and began running back towards his truck, deciding that this was a mystery he didn't wish to uncover firsthand. Driving up onto the side of the road, he managed to whip his truck around, speeding back down towards the fork. This time, he took the other path, following a dirt driveway towards the home of farm owner Danny Johnson, crying out for help as he ran to the door. A dispatcher at the Rapides Parish Sheriff's Office received the call at 6.45 a.m. and immediately dispatched units to the rural road on the edge of town. Investigators found the woman's fully clothed body lying approximately halfway between the old barn and the road, with her feet pointing towards the latter. Unfortunately, due to the grisly nature of the crime, investigators weren't able to determine a great deal about the woman's physical appearance. It seemed that she had sustained multiple stab wounds, but the killer hadn't stopped there. Although they couldn't determine an order at the time, investigators noted that either before or after stabbing her, the killer had gotten into his vehicle and driven over her body at least once, and sickeningly, probably several times. At the time, detectives couldn't be certain if the woman had been killed in that location or if she had merely been dumped there. The woman didn't have any identification or a wallet on her. In fact, the only item police found in the victim's possession was a set of car keys containing a keychain advertising dollar rent-a-car in Dallas, Texas. Detectives were quick to call the car rental company in hopes that they might be able to identify the victim as that would be the first major step in narrowing down their pool of potential suspects, which at this early stage included just about everyone within a thousand miles of Alexandria. Initially, detectives were perplexed by the utter ruthlessness of how the woman had been killed and began operating under the theory that, for things to have gotten so extreme, there had likely been an altercation which had caused the assailant to escalate to this level of brutality, and there was probably a good chance the victim and the killer had known one another as the crime seemed too violent to not be personal. Finding no real evidence at the scene, Investigators began searching through buildings on the farm and along the rural road in hopes that they might find anything to give them a direction. 
Unfortunately, the killer didn't appear to have left anything behind that might help identify him, his victim, or the motive for the murder. The woman's body was removed from the field and transported to Bossier City, where an autopsy would be conducted to try and determine the exact cause of death and hopefully to locate any evidence that might be tied to the killer. Obtaining a description of the rental vehicle from the car company, all units were notified to be on the lookout and to search local businesses, parking lots, and all roads and side streets in the area. Around the same time investigators were radioing out the vehicle description, Teresa's family was starting to get worried. No one had seen her since the previous evening and she wasn't answering her phone. Her mother, Carol, started dialing all of Teresa's friends, but none of them had seen her in the previous 24 hours. Now, with panic settling in, Carol began calling her children to tell them Teresa was missing. Speaking to her daughter, Ginger, Carol explained the situation, but Ginger wasn't certain there was a reason to panic yet. Teresa was a smart, careful woman, and if she wasn't answering her phone, then she was either asleep at a friend's house or she was busy and didn't want to be disturbed. How much of that rationalization was denial speaking, Ginger didn't know, but as time kept on ticking by, she too began struggling with the grim possibilities. Over the course of the next few hours, calls were bouncing in and out of the Wren home, with everyone now trying to track down Teresa, but the answer was always the same. No one knew where she could be. As Teresa's siblings began making their way towards her parents' house, Word came over police radios that the rental car had been found in the parking lot of The Stick, a pool hall and bar approximately nine miles north of Jenkins Road in the southwest section of Alexandria. The vehicle had been found at approximately 10.25 a.m. Investigators arriving at the pool hall confirmed the description and license plate of the vehicle, which according to the rental company had been loaned out to a Teresa Gilcrease three weeks earlier. After a preliminary examination of the car, the vehicle was impounded and transferred to the crime lab for a full forensics inspection. 90 minutes later, at approximately 12 noon, the local media began issuing breaking news alerts about the discovery of a body on the outskirts of town. Teresa's family, gathered together at the home in Boyce, heard the story, and those who weren't already panicking caught up quickly with the others. Ginger would later explain that moment of powerlessness and fear, saying, quote, My heart sank. I did not have a good feeling. End quote. At the time, the sheriff's office released few details saying only that they'd found the body of a woman and that the crime was most certainly a homicide. As Teresa's family watched in a stunned silence, her father Elvin picked up the phone and called the sheriff's office in what has since been described as the most difficult call he's ever had to make. Being put through to the investigators, Elvin explained that while he hoped it was just a coincidence, his daughter had never made it home the night before. At that time, the detective told him that they'd found Teresa's rental car and that the victim had had the keys in her pocket. While he couldn't yet positively identify the victim as being Teresa, the detective told Elvin that they did believe the body they'd found was his daughter's. Nearly dropping the phone, Elvin struggled to find the words but his face told Carol everything and she instantly broke down. At that point, Ginger began calling her siblings to break the horrible news. As hard as it had been to make those calls, Ginger knew the next step would be the most difficult as she climbed into her car and drove to pick up Trisha from her job, where she'd have to tell the new high school graduate that her mother had been killed. The sheriff's office arranged to have investigators sent to the Wren home to interview her family in order to establish a timeline of her last hours and to try and gather any information they could about potential suspects. At the same time, detectives reached out to the owner of the stick and requested that he come down to the pool hall so they could determine whether or not he or any of his employees had seen Teresa the previous night and, more urgently, anyone who may have been in her company. They also sought to assemble a list of names of people who had been in the bar Sunday evening. Since Teresa's car had been found parked at the pool hall, investigators assumed that she likely left with her killer that night, and the hope was that someone had gotten a good look at him or his vehicle. Having gained additional information from Teresa's family, detectives were also sent to the Ramada where she had stayed the weekend of her murder. Employees were shown photographs of Teresa, and several recognized her, 
but no one had seen her in the company of anyone else over the course of her stay. Investigators asked the hotel for a list of any work crews which had been present at the hotel for a job or had been staying there that weekend. In addition, they were asked to provide detectives with a list of all calls Teresa had made or received in her room. Unfortunately, it appeared that the hotel was a dead end, as no connection between that location and Teresa's murder has ever been established. At that point, investigators were working on two very different theories. That Teresa had known her killer, or perhaps that the killer had simply been someone passing through Alexandria and was not local to the area. Just hours into the investigation, very few details had been discovered that shed any light on what exactly occurred the night before. In hopes that locals might have information or may have seen something, the sheriff's office turned to the media to issue a request for assistance from the public. While Teresa's murder in and of itself was enough to frighten and concern residents, Louisiana law enforcement was at that time in the midst of a frenzied search for a serial killer who'd been operating in Baton Rouge, some 130 miles to the southeast. Investigators could neither confirm nor deny any potential connection, though Major Herman Walters would tell the Advocate newspaper that they were of the belief that Teresa's murder had likely been an isolated incident. Within hours of their plea to the public, several people called into the sheriff's office stating that not only had they been present at the pool hall Sunday night, but they'd seen Teresa in the company of an unidentified man. Based on different calls, detectives were able to determine that Teresa arrived at the bar alone, but at some point the unknown man showed up and the two were seen talking. According to witnesses, Teresa left the pool hall between 1.30 and 1.45 a.m. early Monday morning, just five hours before her body was found. No one at the bar recognized the man she was with, but at least one person had gotten a good enough look that investigators arranged for him to travel to New Orleans, where he'd meet with a sketch artist to create a composite on Friday the 14th. Police officially released the sketch to the media later that night. You can see this in the Vodacast if you're using the app. The link is in the show notes. The man was described as being a white male in his mid-30s to early 40s, standing between 5 feet 10 inches tall and 6 feet, and weighing 200 to 240 pounds. Witnesses referred to the suspect as appearing to be muscular and in good shape, with several commenting on the fact that he had very broad shoulders. The man had short, dark hair and a thin mustache, and possibly a light growth of goatee. He'd been seen wearing a blue polo shirt with vertical stripes and a blue baseball cap. While several people saw the man leaving with Teresa, No one had gotten a look at what he was driving or which direction the two went after they left the bar. Investigators also showed photographs of Teresa and described her as being a white female, standing 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighing approximately 140 pounds. She had blue eyes and shoulder-length brown hair. Teresa had been found wearing the clothing she was last seen in, described as a light-colored button-down shirt over an undershirt, blue denim shorts, and black flip-flops. Detectives specified that Teresa wore numerous rings and other pieces of jewelry and that several of her personal effects had not yet been found, namely her purse, license, and cell phone. It was theorized that she likely left these items behind in the suspect's car the night of her murder and locating them could help track the killer, but oddly, police didn't release any descriptions of the items. So what her purse looked like and what model her phone was has never been revealed. Memorial services for Teresa were scheduled to take place on Saturday, June 15th at Horseshoe Drive Baptist Church where she had been a congregant. Her husband, Shannon, was flying in for the somber event and was slated to sit down for an interview with investigators as well. Asked about his late wife, Shannon told the town talk that she was full of life a loving person who always stood up for what was right, fighting for those who couldn't fight for themselves. Carol described Teresa as a beautiful and wonderful daughter that loved her family and had always been driven to help others. The family, like investigators, pleaded for help from the public, with Ginger saying that while an arrest wouldn't bring her sister back, it might save someone else. She explained, quote, It's been hard on the whole family since that day. We want to know why. If anyone saw anything, please call in. The family needs something. 
Nobody deserves that. No one, no matter what. End quote. On Monday, June 17th, Detective Steve Wilmore, the lead investigator on the case, received a copy of Teresa's autopsy report. The examination had not been able to determine whether Teresa had been stabbed or run down first, but her cause of death was attributed to a combination of both attacks, implying that neither the stab wounds nor the vehicular assault would have been enough to have killed her on their own. Releasing some information to the public, Wilmore wouldn't specify the exact number of knife wounds, saying only that she had been stabbed at least five times and had not been sexually assaulted. Wilmore went on to explain that according to the investigation, Teresa had left her daughter's friend's home and rushed in on Sunday night and driven straight back to Alexandria. From there, they believe she visited at least one other bar before arriving at the stick on MacArthur Avenue, where she was later seen leaving with her killer. While witnesses had been able to provide a general time during which Teresa had left the pool hall, no one had actually noticed when she first arrived, and detectives couldn't determine just how long she'd been at the pool hall that night. Wilmore would also state that they'd received several calls from tipsters naming individuals they believe might be involved in the murder. After the release of the sketch, the calls increased exponentially, and investigators were working on each potential lead. In addition, they had conducted interviews with everyone named and assembled several photo lineups for witnesses at the pool hall that night, though by this point, they hadn't managed to get any positive identifications. Detectives were convinced that they were going to track down the killer quickly, with Wilmore telling reporters that it was only a matter of time. Unfortunately, while calls from locals kept the list of potential suspects growing, None of the witnesses were able to identify anyone from additional photo lineups, and detectives couldn't find enough evidence to place any particular person at the pool hall Sunday night. Over the course of the next two weeks, at least eight more photo lineups were conducted with the same result, while dozens of names that had been called in were being tracked down and interviewed, though again, nothing was panning out. By the end of the month, Calls began slowing down, and June would ultimately culminate with detectives eliminating many of the names they'd received from their suspect pool. Sadly, though, July was a month where detectives began to hit a wall. Believing initially that they could track down the suspect quickly, the lack of a positive ID from photo lineups began to reinforce the possibility that the killer wasn't local to the area. Police began tracking similar cases across the country, believing that the suspect might be traveling, and if so, he was likely to kill again. In hopes of spreading the word wider, the sheriff's office reached out to America's Most Wanted and requested that they put together a segment about the case, but producers were slow to respond. Detective Wilmore, who had been highly optimistic at the beginning of the investigation, vented his frustration telling reporters the case was getting a little colder each day, saying, quote, we need a break, bad, end quote. One month later in August, with their list of names shrinking with each new elimination, investigators began realizing that this case was not going to be easy. In search of additional information they believe could provide them with insight into the murder, a pair of detectives flew to Oregon to conduct additional interviews with Teresa's husband, Shannon. Detectives didn't share what exactly they were hoping to get out of the trip, though Major Walters would say it was a routine part of the investigation to follow up with previously interviewed witnesses. Asked about a potential link between Teresa's murder and the ongoing search for the Baton Rouge serial killer, Walters stated that they were in contact with the task force investigating the killings. Detective Wilmore would expand on this slightly, telling the town talk, quote, there are some similarities, but there is no physical evidence linking the Alexandria case to the Baton Rouge case, but the possibility is still being investigated. End quote. On Wednesday, August 28th, investigators announced that FBI profilers who were working to assist in identifying the serial killer were planning to visit the Rapide Sheriff Office to study Teresa's murder. Asked about the status of the case, Detective Wilmore provided several new pieces of information. Wilmore told reporters that they were hoping they might find some answers through DNA, stating that Teresa's remains had been sent to a crime lab in Shreveport who were still working to determine whether or not the killer had left any of his DNA on Teresa's body or clothing. While calls had slowed down, 
Wilmore said they were still receiving them intermittently and were following up on every lead. By this point, more than two and a half months into the investigation, over 50 suspects had been eliminated as the result of interviews and photo lineups. In hopes of obtaining greater detail about the killer, witnesses who had been at the pool hall were put under hypnosis, though whether or not this resulted in any new information has never been revealed. Asked about the trip detectives had taken to Oregon, Wilmore stated that they had confirmed Shannon had been in Oregon at the time of the crime, and he was not on their list of suspects. Discussing the killer, investigators noted that they had found no information to suggest Teresa had known her killer, describing their meeting at the bar that night as a freak encounter. In regard to the Baton Rouge investigation, Major Walters said it had not yet been ruled out, and while there were some similarities, it was looking less and less likely that a connection was going to be found. FBI profilers working with the task force determined that the Baton Rouge killer had selected his victims at random, likely after seeing them somewhere around town. It was believed that he then stalked the victims to learn their routines before striking. They also said the man was likely to be strong, as he needed to lift between 155 and 175 pounds to carry and place the victims in the locations where they were later found. While Teresa did meet her killer randomly in public, no one in any of the Baton Rouge cases had seen the victim out in public with the suspect, and investigators believed he was likely too careful to be spotted that way. It was believed that the killings had seemed more planned than spur of the moment, and, at least in Teresa's case, they had no evidence to suggest that the killer had ever laid eyes on her before the night he killed her. Throughout the following months of September and October, detectives spoke little about the case, saying only that while they hadn't received any new tips in weeks, they were still working hard to find Teresa's killer. An FBI profiler was set to meet with the sheriff's office on Monday, September 30th, but the agent would be reassigned before that meeting could take place. Asked about the search for DNA in the investigation, detectives told reporters that, as of the end of the month, they were still awaiting results from the Shreveport lab, which operated free of charge and as such, had a large backlog of DNA tests to conduct. Several more lineups were conducted through September, but they all ended without any positive identifications. Detective Wilmore was adamant that he had never had a case go unsolved, and he certainly wasn't going to start with Teresa, telling reporters that they were still actively investigating leads, saying, quote, This case is far from being cold, and I don't expect it to get cold anytime soon. End quote. Early in November, the investigation received two devastating blows. Firstly, the crime lab issued their report to detectives noting that they hadn't been able to find any foreign DNA on Teresa's body and clothing. The suspect hadn't left behind any hair, saliva, or physical matter from which DNA can be extracted. Major Walters addressed the bad news, telling the town talk, quote, This hurts us. However, this is still an active investigation. We are not giving up. End quote. The second piece of bad news came when producers from America's Most Wanted finally got back to detectives, explaining that they wouldn't be running a segment on the case due to the lack of evidence and information, which they felt would only confuse the viewers as they had no suspects or directions to look in. Sadly, for a case that police had initially thought they'd solve quickly, December would mark six months since Teresa's brutal murder and they were no closer to finding answers than they had been in the first few weeks. The holidays were an extremely difficult time for Teresa's family, who were gathering to celebrate Christmas without their beloved sister, daughter, and mother. Teresa's father, Elvin, told the town talk that he couldn't stand to hear Christmas carols anymore, and that the holiday season just reminded him of the empty space in his heart. While the family was still determined to find the killer, they did express that a rift had developed between them and investigators as they felt detectives weren't making her case a priority, with Carol saying, quote, We feel abandoned by the establishment, the police department. End quote. They believed that the killer was local and had to be familiar with the area to know about the isolated stretch of Jenkins Road. They also struggled to accept that no one had seen the killer later that night when he would have been covered in blood 
and that no one had seen his vehicle, which would likely have sustained some body damage that night. For their part, investigators stated that the case was a high priority to them, and they were continuing to follow leads. However, with the sheriff's office being so small, they couldn't assign any detectives to work the case exclusively, and they'd have to continue their investigation while also working on new crimes. Six and a half months after Teresa Gilcrease was brutally murdered, 2002 came to an end with no answers, no named suspects, and no new evidence. Three months into the new year, in March of 2003, out of their own frustration with the direction of the case, Teresa's family reached out to Pat Brown, a private criminal profiler who was then the chief executive director of the Sexual Homicide Exchange, based in Washington, D.C. Brown has an established history of providing helpful and insightful profiles of suspects, and when she agreed to come to Alexandria, free of charge, Teresa's family began to feel as though they were finally making some progress. After the sheriff's office conducted a background check into Brown, she was given access to case files and began gathering information for her report. Brown didn't reveal any information to Teresa's family, though she did tell them that based on the files, the sheriff's office had conducted a thorough investigation and were following up on different leads. Completing her examination, Brown left Louisiana, telling the Wrens that she would submit her full report to the sheriff's office upon its completion. Investigators were hopeful for any insight she might provide, as Detective Wilmore noted that tips had stopped coming in months earlier and they had found virtually no new information. Later that month, following the media coverage of Pat Brown's involvement, the sheriff's office received a call from a tipster delivering them another name. According to detectives, the caller stated that they believed this person had been involved in the murder, and while they didn't release details of the call, it was the first one they'd received in a long time that gave them hope that they were on the right trail. In early April, Major Walters announced that they had requested and been granted assistance from the state's attorney general's office joining the investigation. The Baton Rouge Task Force, having obtained unidentified DNA from multiple victims of their serial killer, had been gathering DNA samples from locals, processing more than 1,000 male DNA samples in the state. Due to the killer's apparent knowledge and familiarity with police techniques and his ability to blend in and surprise his victims, they began theorizing about the possibility that their suspect might be someone in uniform, perhaps even a police officer or an impersonator. This kicked off a fierce debate, with local legislators seeking to draft a bill which would require Louisiana police officers to submit their DNA for comparison. Law enforcement officials, however, pointed out that the officers could not be compelled to turn over their DNA, just as regular citizens couldn't be, and that even if they could, it was an expensive process which would cost a lot of money and time to be diverted away from the active investigation, potentially allowing more murders to occur. To say this DNA debate was a heated one would be a tremendous understatement. In mid-April, the name of the man that had been given to investigators as potentially being linked to Teresa's murder was publicly revealed, and this kicked off a shockwave of speculation. Captain Ronnie Wagner of the Rapid Sheriff Office announced that 32-year-old Jason Wayne Alston was among approximately 50 suspects being looked at as being involved in Teresa's murder and potentially the Baton Rouge serial killings. According to the Advocate newspaper, Alston, a lifelong resident of the area, was an eight-year veteran of the Louisiana State Police operating out of Troop E in Alexandria. Following his name coming up, he was placed on administrative leave pending the outcome of the investigation. Detectives would not share what information they'd received from the caller that kicked off the investigation into Alston. However, they did note that he had voluntarily submitted a DNA sample to the Serial Killer Task Force an analysis had shown that his DNA did not match that left behind by the killer in Baton Rouge. While this ultimately cleared him in the case, investigators in Alexandria stated that he was still considered a suspect in Teresa's murder, and while they didn't have DNA from her killer, they were examining all angles to determine whether or not Alston might have been involved. According to statements issued by Teresa's family, 
Witnesses claim that Alston had been seen at a bar Teresa visited the night of her murder and allegedly had also been seen at the Stick Pool Hall. While being present that night isn't necessarily evidence of a crime, it's since been reported that after learning of the murder, Alston did not inform the sheriff's office nor his bosses at the state police that he'd been in the pool hall that same night, which, as you might imagine, aroused some suspicion. While Alston was questioned by investigators, They never revealed any information about those interviews. On Monday, April 14th, the Rapide Sheriff's Office received Pat Brown's full report and profile on Teresa's killer. However, they publicly announced they would not be releasing any of the information or insights she provided. Detective Wilmore called the information confidential and said that maybe in the future some details would be released, but at that time, They wanted to keep it to themselves to assist in the investigation. Wilmore stated that they were following up on several leads and had received calls in the previous week naming additional persons of interest. Asked about Trooper Alston, Wilmore would only say that he had not yet been eliminated as being a suspect. On Thursday, April 24th, Trooper Alston's attorney, Mike Small, announced that after a detective asked his client to take a polygraph, he'd agreed to do so. During the test, Alston was asked many questions about Teresa's murder and his whereabouts during that time. Following the conclusion of the test, which was conducted by a law enforcement agency and two independent examiners, Small said all three agreed that Alston had been truthful when he denied having any knowledge about Teresa's murder. At that point, Small argued, Alston should have been eliminated from the investigation. But while the sheriff's office confirmed he did in fact pass the polygraph, Major Walter said he had not yet been cleared of involvement as they were awaiting the results of lab tests, though at the time, he would not specify what the tests were nor what they involved. It would later be revealed that Trooper Alston's personal vehicle had been taken to the crime lab where they were sweeping for any evidence that might confirm whether or not Teresa had been in or struck by his vehicle. Just over two weeks later, on Wednesday, May 14th, the Louisiana State Police issued a statement announcing that Trooper Alston had resigned from the force. Asked about this later, Alston said that naming him publicly as a suspect had created tension between him and his co-workers, as well as damaging his ability to conduct his duties as a police officer, since his photo was splashed all over the headlines and he had been operating in undercover assignments. Asked about Alston's status in the investigation, detectives again would only say that he had not yet been eliminated. While Teresa's case had some movement, it was slow to develop. But two hours away in Baton Rouge, the task force got a major break in their case. Initially, Baton Rouge investigators described their suspect as a white male who may have been driving a white pickup truck. However, New evidence pointed towards the possibility that the killer may be a black male who was wanted for questioning in connection to an attempted rape. During the course of that investigation, they'd obtained a DNA sample from 34-year-old Derek Todd Lee of West Feliciana Parish, who closely resembled an updated composite of the serial killer. When Lee's DNA was run through the system, it matched DNA found on 26-year-old Carrie Lynn Yoder. Yoder had disappeared from her Baton Rouge apartment on March 3, 2003, and was found 10 days later floating beneath the Whiskey Bay Bridge. She had been raped, beaten, and strangled. On Monday, May 26, police issued an arrest warrant for Lee, but discovered he'd fled the state three weeks earlier, the same day he had voluntarily provided investigators with his DNA. Lee, along with his wife, packed up their belongings and withdrew their children from school, leaving Louisiana and heading north to Chicago before Lee fled again, this time traveling south to Atlanta. Just one day after the arrest warrant was issued, the Atlanta police operating in conjunction with the FBI arrested Lee at a hotel, where he waived his rights to extradition and was transferred back to Louisiana the following day. Initially, Lee was only charged with Carrie Yoder's murder, but further investigation and DNA analysis would ultimately tie him to seven murders between 1998 and 2003. Investigators began looking into Lee 
and discovered he had a lengthy and extensive rap sheet going all the way back to 1984 when he was just 16 years old. As Lee had grown older, his crimes became more serious and included arrests for first-degree attempted murder, stalking, and burglary. He had even been arrested for breaking into a woman's home and stalking her right in the middle of the killings, as well as the attempted murder of his then-girlfriend, Cassandra Green, for which he received a two-year sentence. The task force fell under heavy criticism for not considering Lee a suspect earlier, and it eventually came out that a year earlier, in 2002, the Zachary Police Department had informed the task force that they considered Lee a suspect in two of the serial murders. Despite mistakes they'd made along the way, the task force ultimately felt they'd succeeded in capturing the notorious Baton Rouge serial killer. This elation, however, would be short-lived, as they would make a terrifying revelation. While Lee had definitively been responsible for at least seven unsolved murders in the city, there were others he simply could not have committed. It was then that they began to realize the difficult obviousness of the truth. Derek Todd Lee was not the only serial killer active in Baton Rouge. Until they could identify and locate the other killer, women would continue to disappear, only for their bodies to be found days or weeks later. And while Lee was frighteningly brutal and vicious, the killer at large was a more depraved monster with a flair for torture and mutilation. As the task force launched a new hunt for another serial killer, Back in Alexandria, many were beginning to wonder if Teresa's murder would continue to grow cold, or if maybe there was someone connected to the investigation who was working to ensure that it never heated up. Next week in part two of our examination into the murder of Teresa Gilcrease, we'll follow developments in the case over the years, where we'll dig into the identification and capture of Baton Rouge's second serial killer, and how some of his methods could suggest a connection to Teresa's murder. The continued investigation into former Louisiana State Trooper Jason Alston, the somber memorial conducted by Teresa's grief-stricken family and their demand for justice, accusations of a cover-up designed to protect a suspect, the discovery of familial connections between one suspect and a law enforcement official, and the status of the case as it sits today, nearly 20 years after Teresa Gilcrease's brutal murder. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Cara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B., Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levenin, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacey Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Adorable Susie Summers, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace evidence.com and click on the support option. I want to thank you for listening to this week's episode, part one of the investigation into the murder of Teresa Gilcrease. Originally, I'd planned to cover Teresa's case in a single episode, 
but after a lot of digging, I kept finding new information that I thought was pertinent to the case. So I certainly hope you'll check out part two next week, where we'll conclude our look at the case and dig through all of the theories surrounding this terrible, unsolved crime.